Welcome everyone to Busirius Legal Tech Essentials. Live from Busirius Studios in Hamburg, Germany and from my house in Chicago, Illinois. We're so happy to have you here. Today is our, our intro session where we're going to uh, provide some introductions, talk about some logistics and provide a kind of overview sessions and some of the key ideas and background that will carry us uh, through the weeks to come. We begin in earnest next week on Monday, June 29th. Um, so, my name is Dan Katz, and I'm, I'm a professor at Illinois Tech, Chicago Kent College of Law. In the commercial sphere, I'm a VP of Data Science and Innovation at Elevate, and I'm very proud to say that I'm, I'm the academic director of the newly formed Busiris Center for Legal Technology and Data Science. This center I will help co-run with my friend and colleague Dirk Hartung, who's live in the studios in Hamburg, and I'm going to send him over to take it away. More to come later on. Over to you, Dirk. Thank you, Dan, um, and welcome from myself as well. As Dan so kindly pointed out, um, my name is Dirk Hartung. I'm the executive director of our uh, Center for Legal Technology and Data Science. My research is based on quantitative legal studies, legal data science and computational legal studies, but I also pursue a doctrinal PhD in digital lawyering, unauthorized practice of laws, and generally regulating the legal profession. I happen to be an analyst uh, of the market for legal services at our very own center uh, of the legal profession. Um, and I'm involved in numerous activities um, of our center. It's also my job here before I hand it over to leadership of our school to give a very first introduction um, about our institution. For that matter, I'm gonna share my slides here so that you guys hopefully see a picture of our beautiful Hamburg campus. Um, I know that Northern Germany is not known for its beautiful weather, but I swear this is an authentic photo. And I'm actually sitting right now at the second window from the left uh, that you can see in that picture. Now, Bucerios Law School is a young university. We're only 20 years old. And we have our name, Bucerios, from one of the big German media entrepreneurs of post-war Germany, Gerd Bucerios, whose foundation, Zeitstiftung, um, has built the school and remains its biggest contributor today. We also have good ties to practice. Um, we have a wide international network and most importantly for our purposes, I'd say for the last five years or so, we have been involved in shaping the discussion around legal technology, legal operations and access to justice in Germany certainly on a European level and sometimes punching a bit above our weight class on a global level because that's what we're trying to be, a global beacon for legal innovation and legal technology. Some of you might be wondering how we're doing in the rankings. This is the most important German ranking. It's a bit like the US news ranking in the United States. Uh, we're consistently ranked leading, in fact, number one. And 2014, 2017, and 2020 are the years in which that ranking actually happened. So not leaving anything else, we've been ranked top for more, more than one decade, actually. What I care more about is this our core value, MOOT, which you'll see on campus. That's a piece of art. You'll see it here right in front of me. And it, it means bravery in German. It's really what you need if you want to do things differently. And we're doing things differently a lot here. For example, this program. This program is nothing like, like nothing we've ever done before. So we typically don't do free programs, but rather charge for them. We typically don't teach to a global audience of, I believe, more than 3,500 people over the web. I say that to let you know that we're new to this. Um, we're happy to do it, um, but also to hopefully get you to treat us gently when we make mistakes or things aren't that smooth in the beginning. We do take all of this very seriously, and I think this is best shown by the fact that 
our leadership has shown up here. You're going to hear from both our president and dean, Katharina Bulewerki, and Meinhard Weizmann, who are here to greet you. And I'll hand over to them in a second. Dear participants, hello, my name is Katharina Bulewerki, and I'm the president of Butzeus Law School. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our lecture series on legal technology. The COVID-19 virus provides us with the unique opportunity to reach out online to more than 3,000 people who are interested in this new field. We are proud to teach such a large group from all around the world, being diverse in terms of both origin and level of education. Students and practitioners of all levels of experience. In turn, we have invited an impressive and unprecedented group of lecturers. Be assured that you will listen to almost all the big stars of the scene. The digital lecture series is the launch event of the Center of Legal Technology and Data Sciences, which has just been mentioned, and which we have just established at Butzeers Law School. I take the opportunity to heartily thank both directors of the center, Dan Katz and Dirk Kartong. Due to their incredible efforts, this lecture series has been established within no time. I greet you far and wide. Enjoy the program, and maybe we shall see some of you next year on campus, which, as you might have seen, is always sunny and inviting. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Meinhard Weisman. I'm uh, the CEO of Buserius Law School, and I just want to send you a quick hello. Um, usually, as you might know, we have summer programs on our campus, and one especially on legal technology and uh, uh, legal operations. And when we had to cancel it this summer, and uh, you know, you all know why, then Dirk and Dan came up to us and said, why don't we unite all the top people in the field for these legal tech essentials? And um, I was immediately excited, but uh, I'm now overwhelmed by the participation, both of the people in the field, as well as uh, participants um, that have been mentioned now a couple of times. So um, I wish you great lecture series. I'm keen to listen and sit on on uh, several of them and uh, i hope that you will be on our campus then maybe next year for our summer program or for other um, events on our campus all the best okay so i guess it's back to me now um i'll go back to our presentation in a second here since I do have some housekeeping to do as well. But this is the best part. I want to highlight that this is not a Buzerios Law School only operation. In fact, there are many people who have contributed to that. Um, first and foremost, this fine institution, but then also Dan's institution, Chicago Kent College of Law, which is part of the Illinois Institute of Technology, and of course, Stanford Codex, the Center for Legal Informatics, which greatly influences our thinking and which has brought an impressive number of their affiliated faculty and fellows to our program. Now we cooperate with ELTA, the European Legal Technology Association, which is the best place to find out what's going on in legal tech and innovation across our amazing continent. And if you wanna make connections to people in other jurisdictions. And then we cooperate with Legal Hackers. Legal Hackers is a nonprofit grassroots movement on a global scale. We are co-founders of the Hamburg chapter, but there's certainly a chapter near you, and I really would encourage you to take part in it. It's a great community. And finally, none of what we're currently doing would have been possible without the help of Baker McKenzie. Uh, they are the main supporter and financial sponsor of this program. And it's actually thanks to their contribution that we can make this program free to you, but still compensate our lecturers for their valuable time. Um, so again, thank you, Baker McKenzie. Now, it's my job to speak a little bit about this institution and about the center that we just founded, right? Like a good proud parent, I wanna quickly say what we're doing here. So in the red, you see our actual certificate programs. We, uh, we offer the Butseria Summer Program Legal Technology and Operations that you can um, typically do during the summer. Maybe some of you will do it next year, 2021. We sure hope that you apply. 
If you like what you're seeing over the next couple of weeks, you can get a more intense version there. We also have an LLM and MLB program with a specialization in legal technology and operations if you want to spend a whole year with us. And then we have smaller things, like our legal tech lecture that is really the first contact with the world of legal technology operations and innovation. We have a technology certificate with things like introduction to computer science, introduction to data science, programming, software development, and of course, ethics. We're proud members of IFLIP, the Institute for the Future of Law Practice. Check that out. And then as a good center, we also do research. That's the blue stuff. This is the research group, Yanis, Corinna, Dan, and myself. And you will hear from each and every one of us um, throughout this program on what we spe specifically do research-wise. But a general impression is that we create large data sets that have to be feature-rich, well-documented, and open source so that everyone can use them. We analyze them with methods from text analytics, data mining, network science, natural language processing. And we share um, our work not only with scholars, because that's what academics do, but also with policymakers and practitioners, because we believe that this science has to matter in the real world. Our underlying theoretical foundation is complexity theory. We believe that law and the legal system are complex adaptive systems. If you don't know what that really means at this point, that's okay. We're gonna have more on complexity and complex adaptive systems throughout the whole, the whole program. And by the end, I'm sure you'll understand what we, what we mean by that. Uh, if you wanna get ahead of everyone else and have a sneak preview, you can go to buceri.us slash complex growth and get to our latest paper on SSRN. Uh, it looks at the complex society and the growth of the law and what happens over time in the United States and Germany. It's a great read. If you can wait, um, then August 4th, some of us will present the findings of this paper in a bigger lecture, quantifying legal complexity. So now on to logistics. How is this all gonna work? You know, we have six weeks ahead of us. We're technically not counting the pre-session. So Monday 29th is when it all starts. We'll offer sessions weekdays at 7 p.m. Uh, European time, which is noon in US Central, or if you're living on the East Coast, it's uh, 1 p.m. And we have a variety of lectures available, um, six different categories. We touch things from the foundations of these topics over uh, at the entrepreneurs and great minds of the field. We talk about legal operations, of course, and we, we talk about the pursuit of digital justice. So what do our courts do? How do we make access to justice easier? We're going to hear a lot from scientific folks. So from people who um, try to better understand this system and build the theoretical foundation for practice. And then, of course, we have a category that's called new perspectives on law, where people apply a new mental model to our world and hopefully find new things. All of that is, is mixed a little bit, and I'm sure each and every one of you finds interesting things to attend. You do not have to attend all of them, though you can, because we curated them in a way um, that it makes sense to listen to all of, all of these lectures. But if you're busy or interested only in one part, you can, of course, choose to only go to one or two of these lectures. Now, the one thing that we ask from you right now is make sure you check your mails. Given the fact that you are here right now, there's a good chance that you did so. We use MailChimp, which mails out emails, and sometimes they get lost in spam. And so make sure that you check your spam folder. We will not spam your inbox, though. There's going to be four to five mails per week because we send one, week, uh, one mail sorry, on Monday to let you know what's, what's on the menu for that week and to provide you with these links. And then we send a gentle reminder about one hour so that you don't forget what's going on. Um, it might be more than an hour, might be less than an hour, but generally you're reminded on the day. We hope that's not too much though. Then please check out the website because sometimes new and exciting stuff gets put on our website, um, useri.us slash techsummer. And generally you can always go back there, look at the schedule and also subscribe to our calendar because that's the most direct way of figuring out what's going on. If you subscribe to our Google calendar, that's really all you're gonna need for most parts because we keep that up to date. And then one final remark on how questions work. You see um, this wonderful software, Zoom, has a Q&A tool, so you can ask questions there. You might not see them and not everybody sees everybody else's questions, because if we get sessions with a couple of thousand people, that can be hard to follow. I will group them up, sort through, make sure that we have everything covered, and then when our speaker, like Dan today, is done, 
we, we have going to have a discussion about it and I'll try to ask as many questions uh, as possible. With several hundred, several thousand people attending, we might not get to all the questions, but good news, the conversation continues on Twitter. So all of our lecturers said, if you use this hashtag, if you serious legal tech, and ask your question, or just share your general thoughts about this, then they'll make sure that they can get back to your questions. And we hope that a kind of conversation and community is built over time. Of course, if you're feeling excited right now, as many of you do in the chat from what I'm seeing, uh, feel free to share that too, because uh, we'd like to get the word out on this. And we'd like to make sure that everyone who is potentially interested actually comes here and attends. So the conversation continues on Twitter. Hashtag Lucerius Legal Tech. That's about all from my side right now. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who will kick us off on a, some historical journey, giving foundations of uh, the market for legal services and the different things at play. But you will hear from me again before this is all over, because I'm going to wrap us up. Okay, thanks, Dirk. And uh, I saw one question in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the chat, which was, could we create a LinkedIn group? I think that's a really good idea. So we'll explore that and be back to you with information on that soon. And again, as Dirk noted, uh, the conversation continues as well on Twitter. Uh, so we'll see you there as well. Uh, uh, hope all of us can connect there. Hashtag Bucerius Legal Tech. So I wanted to kind of preview where we're going to go over the next six weeks here. And I also wanted to kind of highlight a, a, a few other points along, uh, along the way. And there we go. So we're going to cover a wide variety of topics. You've probably seen them on the site. Uh, topics like AI, process improvement, design thinking, business models, different types of business models. We're going to talk, we're going to have uh, presentations by some leading entrepreneurs in this space who sort of came, worked through an idea and built a company and, and tried to improve the law in some sort of uh, uh, material way. We're going to hear from some leading folks in legal operations at um, large, large organizations like uh, Google and uh, European Central Bank and Banco Santander. Uh, then we're also going to focus on digital justice and online courts and this topic of legal complexity. I think if you look across all the folks who are lecturers, I think they collectively share a vision, and that's a vision of bringing operational excellence to the law in various forms. And so there are different methodologies people might bring to bear to do that, like design thinking or, or process improvement methods or the application of technology. But I think at its core, it's about ma making the law better, bringing operational excellence, as it might be called. Um, in, in fields outside of law. And the, and the big kind of theme I think you'll see is it's people, process, and technology. What is the right combination of those over time? And so today I wanted to kind of just, you know, take a wide shot and cover a wide variety of topics as we go. But, you know, kind of by the way, you know, we called this the serious legal tech essentials, as has been mentioned. We will have uh, uh, COVID-19 allowing, I, I am very, very hopeful by June 28, 2021, we will have some sort of a better state of affairs on, on, on these topics. So these are the tentative dates for next year. So we'd love to see you in person next year. Uh, it's, a, it's, a much, it's intense uh, for three, three weeks. Uh, so more information on that to follow. But today I want to do an introduction to this field. Uh, we know that people are kind of are at different starting points around these topics. Uh, and so we thought we should just sort of start at something like 30 miles an hour and just go from there. And um, it, we're just going to kind of start. And if what I would say for some of you, if some of these, some of this terminology and ideas are a little bit unfamiliar, just kind of write down the ideas and go explore them uh, on the web. Uh, there should be, there's a, a lot of uh, writing that has been done over, over the past decade and around a lot of these topics. And again, if you have individual questions, we you know, we'd be happy to answer them and maybe point you to a couple things that you can read uh, to backfill some of your knowledge, uh, any knowledge gaps you might have. But again, what, we're just going to get out of the gates now at this point. So I thought the best place to start today was actually to go back in time, go back 10 years, if you will, and, uh, and, and look at this decade that we just came out of in retrospective. And, it, and I think in a sense, the, real, the story really starts here, which is the 2008 financial crisis. So if you look at what happened in the aftermath of the financial crisis, we saw, you know, many organizations were placed under significant economic pressure, including uh, many of the folks who, who purchased legal services, uh, whether that's a big company or uh, 
folks on main, on main street, but uh, I'll particularly focus you kind of on the enterprise space to start, which is many organizations had a relatively, let's call it uh, a legacy model that existed where people purchase legal services in uh, um, from providers. And the traditional model was a uh, lot apartments were served by uh, law firms kind of without question. And that sort of uh, that story began to change as the decade went on. But the, the, the main driver was this, this desire to operate in a more cost-effective manner. And so organizations started to try to bring operational discipline to the, per, to the purchase of legal services. And then legal services much more became legal products and services. And we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, but I would say that that kind of changed the atmospheres, atmospheric conditions and that really allowed this first wave of legal innovation to enter the field. Many of these ideas and principles predate the financial crisis or predate 2010, but they barely began to come to life in a much more material way in the decade that just ended. So if you, went, if you looked in the media, this is what you'd see a lot of, the robot lawyer's thesis. I mean, it seemed like a, in the 2010s, not a week or month went by when we didn't have a, a sort of robot lawyer story. And, you know, this is just a smattering of some of what we saw out there in the, in, the, in the past decade. I would say that it wasn't just one single disruptor per se, but a series of disruptive trends that took place in the past decade. Uh, and that collectively kind of highlighted the decade in legal technology and innovation. One of those things is definitely that legal tech came of age. Now, it's important to say there was legal tech before, before 2010, but the the, the magnitude and growth in the number of, of, um, of uh, tools and products on the market was a big part of the story of the decade we just came out of. One thing we saw, and Dirk mentioned it earlier, is we saw this growth of a kind of hacker community, and I think the parallel could be drawn to what we saw in, in the early days of micro, microcomputing, as, they, as it was called at the time, but there was a thing called the Homebrew Computer Club, which was a group of enthusiasts who were interested in using computers more uh, in, in daily life. And it wasn't a full-fledged industry when it began. It was um, a lot of folks tinkering in their garage and what have you. And that later gave rise to this, you know, to, to big technology companies like we, we see today. So I kind of like think of this legal hack movement uh, as a group of people who had uh, and, and it continues today in a much more material sense, but it began as a, in a few places where there were groups of enthusiasts who would get together. And now it's a global community. And that was a big, that, that happened in the decade we just came out of. You, um, for those of you, I can see there's folks all over the world, of course, in, on this webinar. It's very likely that there is a chapter, uh, as Dirk said, in your, in your area. And if there isn't, maybe there's an opportunity for you to start one. So I think that went from kind of outside the mainstream industry to inside the mainstream industry. We saw significant growth in the sheer number of legal tech startups in the decade we just came out of. And just to kind of document that, there's a variety of these different lists out there. None of them are perfect or represent the entire list of companies by any stretch of the imagination. But if you went to say Angel List, which is a list of venture seeking and venture backed startups, you'll see, you know, one to 2,000 uh, legal tech companies. Not a perfectly curated list again, but just to kind of give you an idea. Stanford Codex keeps a list about 1,250 companies there. Uh, it's growing all the time, but, uh, uh, but you can tech.law.stanford.edu, you can see, and they kind of have a taxonomy of different um, topics that those, those companies follow. And even beyond this, there, there are companies that are on none of the list. There are new companies I hear about every day. It started very much as a kind of US, UK phenomenon, but really it went global as the decade continued. So there are these product maps that people have put together in various, um, uh, in various uh, 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 countries that kind of each node, each node on this map is an individual company and they tend to cluster around different topics, different parts of, of work that, um, that we do here in law. So just to give you a taste for how this sort of grew in the Spanish legal tech market, it's pretty, pretty good size now. Australia and Israel, Brazil, Mexico, Asia, Africa, and the world. And we saw venture capital come into the market. Historically, not a lot of venture capital, still relatively small amount if you think about the, the scale of VC 
money across the entire economy, but as a sheer percentage gain, it's pretty substantial in terms of the amount of money that came in. Now, one of the questions, we have seen some deals close after the kind of COVID-19 uh, and its aftermath, which continues, of course, this day, but, but um, the question is, will this continue? Will the money continue to come into the sector as things will almost invariably will tighten in the, in, the, in the months and years to come? So in sum, I think we had something like 1,500 to 2,000 applications bloom in this period. We're probably going to have consolidation. There'll be more acquisitions and some bankruptcies and some consolidation in the space because you do see this sort of phenomenon where there's, you know, 10, 20 companies all sort of roughly pursuing the same set of ideas. And like many markets, you see first the kind of Cambrian explosion, and then you see the consolidation that happens later. Now, I will just note this, that the boundaries between legal tech and other things are not exactly completely clear. Like there's reg tech and deal tech and parts of fintech and insurance tech and gov tech, which it's not clear why that's not legal tech or why, you know, that I'm just sort of pointing out this. There are these other streams, which if you look on at the extremes, they're different, but at the margins, there's a lot of similarity between what the people are pursuing. So again, if you think of this 1500 to 2000 kind of idea, it might even be a bit bigger if you kind of take this into account. And the other thing we saw is the, the, at the we saw these companies sort of coming online and uh, uh, um, some were startups and now are even bigger companies now. On the other half is kind of what you might call the historic or legacy industry beginning to try to develop different types of engagement frameworks. So I was part of this first one. Uh, 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 Next Law Labs was part of Denton, but many other folk, many other firms went down this path of, of kind of creating incubators where, and accelerators. They're different, different. I call it an engagement framework because they don't all pursue the exact same approach, but you sort of see all these are some of the biggest you know law firms in the world beginning to work to to collaborate and to try to think about how to use use these tools in the delivery of services and you'll hear from some folks that are represent some of these firms and there are many others out there you can read about just to give you a taste and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list this is just illustrative of what what happened um, again some of the bigger brands in law making venture investments and partnerships and other types of arrangements with some of the players out there. Now on the other part of the ecosystem is legal operations. So op there was legal operations prior to 2010, of course, but in this last decade, we saw a significant acceleration in the amount of folks that had a title of director level, VP, some sort of title where they were essentially the operations lead within the legal department of some of the largest companies in the world. And now some, not even the largest, it's going gone further down into the kind of uh, top 10,000 companies, let's say in the world. So we saw a significant increase in this last decade and the emergence of a new consortium of, of folks who wanted to get together and share expertise to accelerate innovation within this space. Uh, called CLOCK. Now there's the ACC group for legal operations and there's the CLOCK group for legal operations. I'm actually quite happy there's two because, you know, both of them are kind of pursuing different, 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 a different agenda in different ways. But the idea is we see more folks doing this work inside of companies, bringing business discipline to the delivery of services and the procurement of services. And that was a big part of the story of the 2010s. One thing that Bill Henderson, you'll hear from later in our, in our sessions, you know, this is, a, I think, a very telling graphic, which is, you know, this is in the U.S., but I think a parallel, um, you'll see parallel trends in other parts of the world as we see a significant expansion in the number of people hired to just work in-house directly and kind of under the idea of make versus buy. You could hire somebody as a full-time employee. It's typically uh, less expensive in certain circumstances than um, paying for an outside person, a consultant, if you will. And so we, that was a big trend over the last two decades, more people working in-house. Many organizations, if you think about it, began their journey, their ops journey in the 2010s. And this was really the, what you might call the first wave of imposing some level of operational discipline on, uh, you know, a kind of a, a caricature, if you will, of the legacy model is, you know, we, we hired the outside firm, they did the work and they just gave us the bill and maybe we tried to knock 10% off the bill. And that was, that's what folks did as kind of legal operations. We got, people got a lot more sophisticated about how to, to sort of, take it to the next level, if you will, for lack of a better phrase in this decade that passed. 
I think you could think of it as wrestling com- control of the supply chain away from the traditional providers. And if you take a step back and you say, you know, what is the driver? And this is going to be a theme for us. What is the driver and demands for what you might call units of legal production? Why do, what is the driver? Well, one of those drivers is complexity. In other words, I hire somebody to do this task for me because it's too complex for me to figure out. And I'd rather pay somebody who does this particular thing all day rather than have me personally have to gain that expertise. Um, And so a, a kind of bigger, and this is a big part of our intellectual agenda, is, is the relationship between social, economic, and political complexity manifests as legal complexity. And again, that paper that we put out sort of is a part of documenting that trend, the growth of the law. Now, this is a somewhat difficult topic to, per, to precisely define. We're going to spend time on that later in the sessions, but I'll just point you to now, here's a series of papers that I've written uh, over the years on this topic. And this is our paper that um, Dirk highlighted earlier that you can take a look at um, on SSRN or archive. Um, but the idea is in virtually every way you might consider it, we've had growth in legal complexity over the past decades. And the question is, how do you match that growth of complexity with the right tool, the land of tools and, and human capital, people process technology? The legacy model is, just to kind of put it in, in relief, just put more people on it. If you have, you use high cost labor to solve high complexity problems. The challenge with that is if complexity keeps going up, you either just keep paying more and more and more, or you have to find a kind of way to work differently. And that just put more people on it does, has not scaled particularly well um, from a practical or, or an economic standpoint. And it broke in a sense in the 2010s. And so people are beginning to learn how to work differently. So overall in the 2010s, I, I think you can say the supply chain was, was kind of finally disrupted. We used to have this world of law, I'm gonna pick law firm A or law firm B if you were um, a, a client or customer. Now there's all these players that are uh, players or approaches that are competing uh, for, to, to, uh, to do the work. Law firms, big four accounting, law companies, legal tech, insourcing, meaning use your own people, right sourcing, what have you. And whether that's directed internally by corporate counsel or legal operations professionals or assembled by outside firms or vendors, I think everybody's sort of trying to become a law company. And what I mean by that is trying to build a blend of products and services to solve various legal business problems. And in the 2010s, we saw law firms slowly trying to transition their business model. And I think in the 2020s, folks are going to get increasingly good at the product service bundle. We see more and more of it where problems are being solved by mixtures of technology or micro products plus services combined to solve problems more effectively. Now, my personal view is that is going to eventually lead to some sort of push for capital. And I just, you know, one thing that's interesting to keep your mind or keep your eyes on is what has happened kind of with, with companies on the London stock exchange, aim listings and otherwise is, um, this I, I consider to be a little bit of a watershed, which was a UK law firm selling 25% of the firm publicly. Uh, this was la- uh, last year um, and uh, being, becoming a public company. And that um, we've had Slater and Gordon do that before that and some smaller firms, but this is a, a top 25 British law firm listing. And uh, <clears throat> you can see the valuation that they were, they were given. So keep your eyes on that. Last thing I'd say is, you know, the, in the decade that passed is, you know, law.edu slowly begins to adapt in this period that we just came out of. It, we, we it, you know, I've spent much of my time in, in, law, in law.edu, which has all the headwinds to change that we see in the rest of law, but also you have actual lifetime tenure in the hands of the decision makers. So the challenge with that, of course, is that's not a huge recipe for innovation. So I, I, I will say, Notwithstanding that fact, we, are, we see green shoots at various places around the world. We see notable efforts to inject legal innovation topics into legal education, although I would not say uh, the majority of schools today are doing that. More than zero, so that's progress. Quite a bit more than zero, including here at Busarius, at my school, Chicago Kent, and many others. So in summary, these are just some of the efforts that happened in the 2010s. I'm trying to just give you a download of 
this is what happened in the decade. None of it was obvious that this was all going to happen. Uh, it, it, you know, in fact, if I, I just want to remind some of the folks who have been on the scene a little longer, if I took you back to 2010 and I told you by the end of the decade, we'd have 2000 legal tech companies or so around the world. This legal operations function would grow exponentially. A bunch of these law firms would have tech incubators and accelerators and doing venture investment. Uh, a, num a, a large number of law schools, a reasonably large number would have programs and certificates and degrees in legal innovation and a top 25 British law firm would be listed. You wouldn't have believed any of that. Not one single one of those things and they all happened in the decade we just came out of. And so now the question is, what is COVID-19 gonna do to accelerate digital transformation? I guess we'll have to see. And digital transformation is kind of the new um, you know, buzzword du jour uh, around these topics, but it, it's a lot of the old topics, but with a new label. So legal innovation. I just want to point out that it is bigger than just legal tech. It, legal tech is an important subset, but there, when we say people process technology, we're interested in innovations in all three dimensions. Uh, for example, we, we have a session on design, we have a session on process improvement there. That's more in the process. I consider that more in the process side of things. Um, we have quite a bit on tech, including AI, and we have innovations in uh, it, with people as well, including, well, we're all working at home now. Again, I'm coming to you live from my house. I, I kind of think it's funny, you know, uh, if you went back to February, all these people said you could, you know, this job has to be done in the building by May. Everybody's saying, you're not ever coming into the office again. We're going to do everything from home. That's a little extreme, but you know what I'm kind of saying. It, it was, we had a, we had a, a, a something that would have might've take two decades happened in the period of like uh, 120 days or something like this. So, um, we'll have to see what this all brings. So with there, let me, let me just, I wanted to hit a few things here kind of to uh, drill into uh, a few topics. One is I just want to mention market structure and market dynamics. And I just want to say, when we're going to talk about this throughout, there's no legal market per se, but there's a bunch of sub markets and you could divide it up in a bunch of different ways. This is how Bill like Henderson, you'll hear from later, likes to talk about there's like a legal profession and there's the legal services industry, and then there's the legal industry. And you could kind of think of legal tech as being on that outer band. And whether those are the scales is, is a, you know, it's not to scale necessarily, but it's a kind of way to talk about it. Another way you might talk about it is you'd say, who is the client and what is the offering? So this is, you could cut it up a bunch of different ways, but you could say, well, there's kind of these Fortune 1000 companies, there's mid cap companies, there's retail, which is kind of the law for everyone. And then there's access to justice, which is really law to help support poor people who need assistance on various topics. And then there's different offerings one might craft. Historically, it's services, but there's, now there's all these products. And then there's this question of how, how do you blend products and services together, kind of a hybrid model, if you will. And you could do a very nuanced treatment of each of these sub-markets, but uh, again, I don't think there's any disruptor per se, but a bunch of things happening in each of these sub-markets. Obviously, law firms compete against other law firms. Uh, that's, you know, pretty straightforward. There are other players in this ecosystem that I highlighted earlier. Big four law companies, legal tech, and the clients themselves. So obviously, it's worth noting, you know, uh, uh, if you talk about scale, you know, um, Deloitte, PwC, EY, are enormous even compared to the top 10 law firms in earth. It, it's, it's in a totally different universe in terms of scale. And this has been a question people have asked for many years in different forms, you know, counting firms going to move into law, you know, formally or informally, and they have more and more are doing this. And so that's been a theme that's out there. And we've seen kind of incremental moves. This was an, I think a meaningful move. This is an even more meaningful move buying, um, Pangea 3 from Thomson Reuters. And then kind of another group of players. Uh, this is a place that uh, bought my company called Elevate. And they're uh, what's called a law company or they've historically been called alternative service alternative legal service providers. But the idea was they were an alternative to just using law firms for everything. Um, so that there's a series of these um, ASLPs or law companies um, United Lex, Elevate, and Axiom. And so the, we saw substantial growth of those companies over the last um, decade. And um, keep your eyes on them because they're part of this broader ecosystem. 
they're on this journey that I think everybody's on, which is first you start off as a labor arbitrage business, then you become a process arbitrage business, and then you got to do the technology and data, data and technology integration. So labor arbitrage is just, hey, um, you know, instead of having a, a lawyer in New York do this for $500 an hour, you could have somebody either within, say, the U.S. or North America or somebody around the world do this work um, who's, you know, highly capable but does not have the cost basis of the Manhattan footprint, let's say, or the London footprint or the Frankfurt footprint, whatever it happens to be. Um, so that's kind of this first wave. Then, then you sort of can combine that with, with having a, a, a efficient processes to deliver and then combine that even further with technology and data integration. So a lot of the companies are working on this. They've done the labor and process arbitrage. Now it's about how do we use data and technology to really accelerate that even further. I mean, that's, that's kind of the play. But I think that's the whole business. I think the microco- this is a microcosm for all of the business. In other words, everybody's sort of trying to become optimize that, those ideas. Now, legal tech, we're going to spend lots of time on, so I won't push on it too much more today. And Dirk will say a little bit uh, at the end. But the clients themselves, I mentioned this earlier, but again, every customer has the, we could do it ourselves or we could pay somebody on the outside. And I showed you one of the dynamics is we've seen substantial growth in the number of people who work as in-house counsels for companies. And so this is kind of a dynamic that's out there. It, it is cheaper if you have the volumes at, at, to do the work in-house. Now you might choose to hire outside counsel because they have deep expertise or, um, they can deliver it, say, ultimately they get better at cost-effective delivery, but generally if it's, if it's straightforward enough, this is what's driven this dynamic, which is you know, a 200% growth over 20 years that, that um, Bill has documented uh, in, in the number of folks working in-house. And, and again, I mentioned this group, Clock, and we'll hear from Mary O'Carroll, who's the president of Clock and heads legal operations at Google. Uh, you, this grow, grew, grew substantially in the 2010s from a I remember I spoke at the first event. It was uh, at the West in, in, in San Francisco, uh, St. Francis Hotel, about 450 or so people, then 1,200 in 2017. So there's 2017. That's the Bellagio Ballroom. And then like 2,000 in 2018, and then 22, 20, or 23, 2,400 in 2019. They didn't have the 2021 because of, uh, you know, obvious reasons, the, the, the coronavirus, you know, that ended, the, you know, uh, uh, pretty much every conference. Uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so you'll hear more from Mary about this about uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, later on in our sessions. Another topic I'll say a little bit about is productization and scale. So what you want to keep in mind is law historically has been a service business through which people um, deliver subject matter expertise, typically by the hour. And if you think about, you know, for the law students in here, you've been kind of, we, even if you do the, if you, on many of your assignments, uh, uh, say in your writing class, for example, are about let's draft a memo, that's the, that's the service. We're gonna, do, we're gonna provide expertise in a written form or we're gonna have you draft a contract and that's, a, that's the offering. The services are delivered, you can think of the contract as a product of sorts, but basically they're giving you, their units of service as delivering you the product and the product is the contract, if you wanna think of it that way. But basically we would call that a service business. I think it slowly is becoming something else now. We're seeing this productization of legal knowledge in various forms. And that takes you down to here. This is where it gets interesting. In my view, the products are almost never a complete solution to the problem. So the, ser- the service, the service, the challenge of the service is you, you, you know, you end up reinventing the wheel sometimes over and over again or what have you. And the pure products don't all, typically don't fully solve the problem. So the question is, how do you blend products and services? And, and a lot of roads lead to this middle here, hybrid products and services that I'm showing you here on the screen. So keep that in mind. How, if you look carefully at the products, you'd say, well, does this completely solve that person's problem? I think you're often gonna answer no. And the question then is, how do you put a service layer around that? And that's a lot of what is what, when you see these law firms that have these incubators and accelerators, they're exploring how would we combine the products and services to solve some as a solution to somebody's problem and you'll get these slides but basically what i want to show you is everybody is trying to get into somebody else's box here people are looking for other adjacent markets but i think a lot of roads lead to the middle here 
products and services being blended together. One of the things that's nice about products is it solves the just-in-time imperative. I mean, imperative that people sometimes face. I mean, you, you sometimes face these problems where you can't instantaneously scale the number of people you have, but you can turn on an instance of a product. Now, again, products don't typically solve the whole problem, but they can. As a business, a product can help you cross-sell services, which is nice. And they can be blended with services like I showed you. And products make you hard to get rid of. In other words, you know, if you have a Visa software in there, it's harder to get fired because they have to unwind the software. Anyway, that's just worth noting. And if you look at a product business, we'll typically get a much higher multiple. So if you saw that law firm that went public, they got a multiple of like 1.7 times revenue, which is not really fantastic. I mean, a, a product business can get a five, seven, 10 times revenue multiple um, in terms of how much the, com the valuation of the company. So if it, let's make it up. Let's say they're selling $5 million worth of products. If you apply to 5X multiple, the company's worth $25 million. Um, a one, you know, uh, uh, whereas a five, a five, five multiple, uh, and you're getting two times revenue, you'd only be worth 10 million. So product businesses forget that for a reason, but that's just worth noting in all of this. One of the other challenges is that tech is historically been a capital intensive field, meaning it takes a bunch of money. You have to invest into a product to get a return over the medium to long term. And there have been challenges for law firms historically accessing the capital markets. And we'll talk more about that later on in our session on regulation. But um, this has just been one of the reasons, you know, sometimes people say, why did all the products get built outside of the, of the historic players? And, and it, this access to capital is, is an important part of, of the why of that. Because people on the outside always think, well, won't, won't the law firms make all the products? And the problem is the capital has got to come from somewhere to build all that. And there are notable exceptions to that, but that's been a, a headwind in all of this. So the race is on, as I see it, but how do you going to blend these products and services together? That's the race. I'll say a couple words about process improvement now um, <clears throat> because we'll have a whole session on it, but just a preview. If you look across the whole economy, there are various efforts to convert what might be considered an artisanal process and into an, an industrial process. Um, the industrialization of the artisan, if you will. And its intellectual origins are, are quite old. If you go back way back in time and you looked at something like the wealth of nations, it's about, you know, standardized parts and standardized processes and, and the economic gains that, that, that came from, from, not, from not doing everything on an artisanal basis. You can fast forward and see this in the automotive field, um, which, you know, is the, essentially the highest, one of the highest ticket uh, consumer items uh, out there. And so Henry Ford is a, you can see a direct line from Henry, from Wealth of Nations into Henry Ford and then into something like the Toyota production system. And we'll talk more about this, so I won't get ahead of myself here. But the key idea is just because you industrialize something does not mean you don't want to keep the artisanal aspects of things. So the ideal scenario is keep the artisanal properties, but do it in a more scaled way. And so instead of having one handcrafted car, we can sell lots of cars to lots of people and we'll lower the cost of cars. And if we look at something like access to justice, this is constantly a theme, is that it costs too much to deliver law because it's too artisanal and not industrial enough. This is something that they'll talk more about, but um, this is a picture from the CIFARF people. This is a process as we think it is. This is a process as it actually is. And this is a process as it should be where as it should be is it, if the person who was paying for it knew what was going on, would they pay for it? That's what the as it should be. And I think we sometimes delude ourselves into how, you know, some, sometimes things take a lot of touches just to complete when those touches aren't really necessary. Again, streamlining processes, and you'll hear more about that later, is about getting more of the world toward closer to the as it should be. And these are the two methodologies, Lean and Six Sigma, these are two of the methodologies that are out there. I personally believe they can affect, can help every subsector within law. Um, and the big idea is you have this high volatility process where things, you know, things are kind of going like this and you can never make it perfect like this. But if you go from this to this, it's a big improvement in terms of waste. You know, again, I don't want to get ahead of what, what they're going to, the, the um, you know, say waste or what have you. But, um, but anyway, you're left with this, useful artifact at the end of mapping your processes. And the maps are never perfect. The idea is that it's a first order representation and it gets refined over time. 
So a process map is thinking about all the steps that you're actually undertaking. And I'll just remind you, these maps are in people's minds. They have it. They know what the steps to complete a process are. They've done, typically they learn this through experience, but it is hard to distribute that to lots of people if it's in your mind. And so having these maps, these are some of the benefits, increasing response times, increasing margins, predicting resource loads and coordinating across large numbers of people. And we teach a full length class at my school and we have um, the two leads coming in to, to teach our one of our sessions which I'm very happy about. But last thing I'll say is I want to talk about combining process maps with data because every process map is kind of an estimation of the reality of what the process is. When you connect that with data is when it gets really interesting. So you use data to illuminate what the pro actual processes are and then be able to answer questions, make predictions. These are the questions people always want to ask. How long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost? But if you don't know the process and you don't have any data, it's pretty hard. You're, I mean, you can try to make an estimate based on your own experience. That's all you're going to have. You have no way to anchor that to actual data or to provide a distribution of, of things. So, but if you have every unit of work linked and logged to a process map, then the process map can first become more reflective of reality. Obviously, you don't want to create a ridiculogram, which is just this idea of people you know, sometimes when they're doing the process map, they're like, and then I put a staple on the piece of paper, you know, things like this, uh, uh, or what have you. I mean, you, there's a layer, you don't want to get too deep in terms of mapping the processes. It's, it's, there's a, a kind of an ideal layer of abstraction you want to have. But once you can make predictions about individual nodes or steps in a process, then you can make predictions overall. And this is what people desperately want in this field, which is greater predictability. So being able to answer from actual data, how long will this take and how much will it cost? That's what people want to be able to do. Many organizations are quite a ways away from this still to this day, but that's the combination of two ideas, data, AI, data science type ideas and process improvement, which we're, we're going to talk about both those things. This is the combination of those two ideas. And I want to conclude my, my part by just talking about this idea of unbundling and a team of rivals. So uh, Richard's book, um, probably best known book is the end of lawyers question mark. We're just going to talk about it. Richard's going to talk about his new book, which is really good uh, on online coins and incredibly timely, by the way. I mean, he draft this book is was crafted before COVID-19, but boy, is it ever relevant now? I mean, it was always relevant, but boy, it's like extra relevant because I think the adoption timeline was going to be a lot longer until we had to shut down, uh, you know, lots of institutions. Now it's, it's, not, I mean, on, on a lot of people's mind, but if you think about this book, um, you know, unbundling is talked at length about this book. So what's unbundling? It's this process of taking, say, a piece of work and breaking it into its component parts and then maybe hiring people to do different pieces of it. And he talks about this path from bespoke to commoditization in the book. Folks talk a lot about commoditization. I think you should think more like getting from to standardization and systemization is a big improvement from everything being bespoke. Now, one of the dynamics is that the customer or client can do their own packaging. In other words, they can take control of the supply chain and do the dividing things out to, to individual vendors or people. But we've moved from this world of everything goes to a white glove single provider to this what might be called team of rivals, this world of a team of rivals. So let's say folks working together from different organizations who aren't, who are sort of competitors with one another, but you know, they, they kind of sort of work together, hopefully. What does that look like in reality? You take a piece of litigation and it has a lead counsel and maybe there's an outsourced discovery team and an outsourced outside discovery counsel and a tech provider and they're, all these folks are working together. Now that, that's one version of it. Um, again, where each person is a specialist on that particular thing they're working on. And on a transaction, it could look like this. There's a lead counsel, there's an outsourced diligence team, there's the big four, there's a tech provider, and they're all working together. I think the big question now is whether there's going to be rebundling. So as firms develop, um, law firms develop other capabilities, are they going to rebundle and say, well, we're not doing it all with high price associates. We have more cost effective strategies with, you know, um, either folks that don't, we don't have as large of a cost basis or technology combined, and we're actually going to assemble an overall solution or does the customer going to do that? That's the, that's the give and take or the push and pull. 
just to keep in mind, kind of on the economics. So in conclusion, you know, it's always a little unclear to where to start on all these topics. There's a lot going on here. And hopefully if you take the six week view of this, we're going to show you this from a lot of different angles. But and again, this is a bit of a patchwork of an introduction, but I wanted to kind of hit on a lot of different topics that folks are going to go into more detail in the, uh, in the sessions to come. But I would just encourage you to always focus on the economics here uh, and, and keep this in mind. Why do we have lawyers in the first place? Now, you could offer a very high-minded answer to that. So let me just kind of say it in a little bit of an alternative way. Why do people pay money to consume units of legal production? In other words, Somebody has a budget and they spend money and they're buying something when they do it. They're not totally irrational. So they're, they're spending the money to get something in return. So I would say there's at least these three reasons. They're solving, they're having you solve a problem that's of enormous complexity to them, but maybe of lower complexity to you because you're a specialist and you know a lot about that. And that holds at all levels, by the way, uh, even in the retail sector. In theory, maybe they could learn how to do it, but they would rather just pay you um, and they get some assurance from that, by the way. People are being paid, paid to manage risk, including legal risks. And the other reason you hire a lawyer is you don't have the scale. So you're a company, let's say, and you have your own lawyers, but you have a problem and all of a sudden you need hundreds of people tomorrow. You don't have hundreds of people, so you have to get scale by hiring an outside person. So these are at least three of the reasons that people, these are economic reasons why people um, uh, buy, pay for lawyers or buy units of legal production, I like to call it. But um, so then you yeah, keep in mind, what is the legacy business model by which people do that consumption? This is a service business historically where people um, work under what's called time and materials, be what we call it in construction. But, but basically, it's just subject matter expertise sold by the hour is the dominant business model. And it's still the dominant model today after you know, the decade I just talked about, but little by little progress is being made on this topic. But the question about all of this legal innovation topics is whether aspects of that legacy model of just selling by expertise by the hour, which again is still the dominant model might be augmented or replaced by some alternative. And that's kind of the, that's the theme. That's the economic theme where all these other ideas enter the equation. So with that, uh, I, I'm very happy to have you all here. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Dirk, who's going to um, offer a few thoughts and close us out here for today. So, uh, so Dirk, over to you. First of all, I think I'll quickly go into some of the um, questions that were asked really quickly. Um, I, I tried to reply to all of them in the Q&A function, so all of these should be re replied. There's a chat and there's a Q&A, which is somewhat confusing. Um, I can handle it better in the, in the Q&A. Um, but I try to also answer stuff um, in the chat. Uh, number one question, do we make recordings available? We currently do not plan to make recordings widely available. I understand that there are issues with time zones and work um, on an individual basis. Just let me know which session it is that you precisely need. Um, we'll try and work on a solution that does not give us headaches around GDPR and uh, digital rights management and all that. Um, we'll do our best. I can't make promises, but just let me know which individual sessions would be interesting for you. We are not currently thinking about making them, all of them available because we want a community and we want people to, to attend these lectures live. Um, second question was around topics. Will there be a question, or, or will there be a, to a lecture on topic one? Will there be a lecture on topic two? These kinds of things. Um, and I think our website is really the best resource on what, what topics are going to be like. I'll take with me the idea of um, maybe giving descriptions. I'll reach out to lecturers and see what they can do. Um, but we read all of what you said and take it very seriously. Same is true for a LinkedIn group and ways to organize among participants. We have had thoughts about that too. Um, and we'll evaluate it and let you guys know what's going on, ideally also on our website and via email. Uh, question, can you still sign up? What about your friends who aren't signed up yet? Yes, you can. This is rolling admission. Um, there is no deadline. You can actually sign up at any point in time to, during those first uh, six weeks. Um, I think th uh, that's, that's about it from the administrative questions. And I will probably now wrap up um, what Dan has said and share my screen again. So what should you take away in general from this very first and introductory session? Um, I think one, 
This is what lawyers do. Lawyers manage risk and handle complexity. That's, um, and lawyers here is a broad term. Uh, judges do this. Uh, litigators do this. People in the administration do this. They help corporations and people deal with the legal system. Um, and that is the functional understanding that we've tried to get across today. Now, what's complexity again? It's complicated. Um, there are complex adaptive systems. It, it has a background in physics and math. It's applied to various, uh, various fields. These topics here that, that we show on that screen, they are parts of what makes a complex adaptive system, but there's going to be a whole topic dedicated to it and sessions around it. So don't worry. Just keep in mind, we're not talking about complicated. We're talking about complex. Now, why does all of this matter? Well, here you see the duration of first instance uh, trials in Germany, commercial, commercial trials uh, from 1995 to 2017. And you see how many cases we actually got. So red is how many cases we have and yellow is the duration. So if you look at that, we have about 40% less cases since 1995. That means in 1995, we had way more cases, first instance cases, in German courts. Now, these cases, though, take about 40% longer. That means that something is going on in our society that makes it harder to handle legal complexity. Maybe the products become more complicated. Maybe the world has become more complicated. Maybe um, societal conflicts are just more faceted and more diverse than they were before. And we see it that our courts have a hard time dealing with it. Imagine the number wouldn't go back, then our courts would be overwhelmed already. But also, if people are not more litigious, um, weren't more litigious in the 90s, then maybe these people who are not going to court anymore are choosing to do something else or not to pursue their rights. And that's a problem. So figuring out how we handle this complexity, and that really is what this whole program is about. Figuring that out is really important for our societies. And that's why the science in, the, in this aspect really matters because we can't accept that fewer people go to court and that it takes forever to actually enforce your rights. Okay, let's get back to the legal technology. You have seen maps, you have seen like over a thousand different providers are in Stanford's tech index right now. So how do you make sense of it? There are different men mental models out there. This is the one that we're suggesting. We say, look, at the very bottom, there are enable technologies. Those aren't legal tech, they are tech. This is your network solution. This is um, may maybe your, your IT security, your cybersecurity, and those topics are important, but that is not legally legal specific. Then we come to support process solutions, as we call them. So that's technology to help you digitize your processes that is digitizes how you work. Um, case management, document management, billing, HR, these kinds of things. Some are legal specific, others are not. And then there are substantive law solutions. And that is digitizing what you do. So that can be due diligences, disclosures, that can be um, other forms of litigation, that can be risk management, transaction, document review, all of that. This is where you take what lawyers traditionally do in all, so, all sectors of the economy and the government and helping them with that. I think this is a very good, simple model if you encounter a new solution to figure out where you are. Now back to law firms business models. Dan has mentioned that, but I know that if you're not familiar with thinking about the market for legal services, then um, a lot of this is new. And I wanna bring it back and put it into two slides. This is my first one. So on. Uh, on one hand, in the gray, we have what's going on today, or maybe I should say a couple of years ago. Um, then every, every business really has a value proposition. And so that's what good do they do for you? And then it has an operating model. So how do they work? And we look at individual parts of that and contrast what's going on today, and what's going on tomorrow. And some of that, of course, is already happening. So let's first look at clients. Clients in the traditional model need help with the law. They need someone who can figure out a legal question, who can file a claim. That's really all they want. So they'll go there, they get a lawyer, but you need, 
what they expect you to do is help them with a very specific legal problem. And experts are good for that. Now, the client of the future, if everything that Dan has just shown us is true, they'll, they'll need someone who helps them deal with the rising complexity. And that is a very different need. Like the guy there is overwhelmed by, by the legal world around him, and he needs someone to sort that out. So he still needs someone to figure out the right legal solution, but he also needs someone just to organize the legal world around him. This corresponds to an offering. In the traditional model, you offer basically legal advice on transactions and probably in litigation. That is what most law firms do. Um, and and the, you produce documents and, and it's a good job. I don't, I don't want you to think that this is not valuable work. I just want to say that if the client's needs change and they require more, then offerings are going to change. So here we see an engineer. They might, um, in the future, law firms will also provide project management, process improvement, legal technology consulting, because somebody needs to make sense of this world. And this is a service that people could expect to find in a law firm, or if law firms don't do it, of course, and that's true for all of what I'm going to say, then someone else will do it. Let's talk about how they make money. Uh, typically, revenue model is billing by the hour. Billing by the hour really means that the risk of this becoming a very expensive transaction is um, transferred to the client. Why? Because we believe that the client knows better whether or not the case is going to blow up. Now, sometimes that's true. But more often than not, it's a very exceptional case for one client, but it shouldn't be for a law firm that handles all of this. So what's the future going to be like? It's more nuanced than, than this. See, the cap we got there is you can pay a cab by distance. You can pay a cab by time. You can pay a cab a fixed fee. You can maybe negotiate with a cab. So there's, it's a whole different pricing model that's, that's out there. And that will, by the way, um, strike the legal market and to a large extent already has. There are caps um, on retainers. There, there's a lot going on in that space. Now, this is the value proposition. Going back to the operating model, how do, um, how do law firms do what they do? Well, first of all, we look at the value chain. And right now, it's pretty much do-it-yourself land. So you have associates, senior associates, partners, they work, and everything they do is handled either by them or by someone of, one, of, one of their clients, sorry, one of their colleagues. So there isn't really labor arbitrage in here. Maybe there is some with paralegals and secretary, secretaries, but really all of the product that you sell is assembled, so to speak, by lawyers. Now the future, the value chain could be disintegrated or you could own more of it. So um, th that's why it's, it's, the same, it's the same vegetable but you're not growing it yourself, you're just selling it. You might be able to outsource parts of it. You might be able to outsource tech, you might be able to outsource due diligences. And so the, the value chain basically is no longer entirely in one firm. That's a chance, but that's also a risk, of course. Now let's talk about cost. Cost structure really is today people. Dan, Dan mentioned that when you look at the valuations of, uh, of law firms when they go public, the market very clearly knows that the most valuable asset of a law firm is their, their people. And people are great, but they don't really scale very well, right? Economies of scale with people don't work all that well. You can work a person maybe, maybe 80 hours a week, but that's it. You, they're never gonna reach like 200 hours. Now, if the cost structure is technology plus people, then you might be able to do that because technology has really, like really, really marginal cost if you can scale it up. And then, of course, there's how law firms are organized. What we see right now um, is, is the pyramid model. And on the other side, we see the rocket model. Um, I have another slide that goes into details here. Today, we know a lot of junior lawyers and some senior lawyers, then partners. That's about it. Um, there is some outsourcing and automation going on. But we think that more and more, you start to see that, especially with firms and, uh, and law companies, so these new providers, like, uh, like Elevate, for example, you see that there's only a part, like this rocket that is still made out of junior and senior lawyers and partners. But there are other people that are contributing to this. So the way the business model is organized and the way you actually organize a law firm or legal services provider does change. This is really what this whole slide is about. Um, by the way, 
This is from a study that we did in 2016, Buceros and the Boston Consulting Group. And if you Google Buceros and Boston Consulting Group, you probably find the whole study. I recommend it as a very um, introductory approach to the topic. And if you have time, you might, you might want to do that. I read in the chat that many people wanted um, some recommendations on reading. And we try uh, to encourage our, our lecturers and do that ourselves. It's your opportunity to let you guys know that there is one. Okay. Finally, let's talk about legal education. Um, this, is, uh, this is the model that we try to follow, the T-shaped lawyer. The T-shaped lawyer, which really, um, the T-shaped knowledge professional had been around for some time, but then a former student of Dan's had, I believe, six or seven years ago, hi, Armani Smathers, has applied this to, um, to the legal world. And it means that you have one area of deep expertise, substantial legal knowledge, and then you have a number of skills stacked on top. So this is uh, business tools, acumen. This is, of course, technology, data analytics, what we're talking about here. Then there's process and project management um, that you can combine. It actually helps you because you stack skills and you um, outcompete the other people around you. And also law schools no longer just focus on substantive law expertise, but want to give you these other parts as well. Now, there are other models out there, but this is basically what it all comes down to. Um, we as schools have to figure out the top stuff. Um, good for me, because my job is figuring out some of these fields for Bucerios Law School, but also good for the students um, and for future professionals, of course, because you get more skills that are hopefully helpful um, in your professional context. This is um, really my second to last slide. Um, I mean, it, I was tempted to do this because, you know, robot lawyers and it's a really beautiful picture. That guy who took it, Dominic Sky, that's probably a very talented photographer. Um, I'll have one final look at the, uh, at the questions and see if there's anything that we want to we wanna answer right now. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe one thing. Um, since people are asking about, about the, the calendar and Outlook and all of that, there's a whole mess around how calendars work and the big providers have not really found a way of putting all these together, but there is a ton of solutions that let you um, subscribe to a calendar like a Google calendar and port that towards your solution. Um, I'm sure the internet can work that out for you. I think all the other questions have been pretty much handled. Um, we're looking really forward to seeing you on Monday, where it will be me and Dan again, and then a lot of other people for the weeks to come. Um, I'm excited that you made it here. Um, I'm glad that so many people showed up. And the only thing I can say is uh, thank you, goodbye, and don't forget, the conversation continues at Twitter, at Bucerius Legal Tech. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>